Welcome. We shall now move on to a discussion of the interstellar medium, and I shall devote two lectures to a discussion of this particular topic. In today's lecture, we shall concentrate on the atomic gas in the interstellar medium. More particularly, we shall discuss the gaseous nebulae, why they shine, and what we can learn from their colors. The 21 centimeter radio radiation from neutral hydrogen atoms, and the distribution of neutral hydrogen in galaxies, in particular our galaxy. As we journey through the interstellar space, we will encounter spectacular gaseous nebulae, dark clouds, and supernova remnants. Let us look at a few of them. Let us now discuss the gaseous nebulae first. There are two questions we wish to answer. One is, what makes them shine? And secondly, what can we learn from the radiation they emit? Now let us look at this picture over here. What I've shown here are two different types of street lamps. This is bluish in light, and this is golden yellow in light. And here is the sort of light that you would see in shopping centers, sometimes red, sometimes green, sometimes blue, and so on. The question is, why are these lamps producing different colors? They're producing different colors because these lamps are filled with gas, different gases, for example, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon. These street lamps are filled with sodium vapor, and these street lamps are filled with mercury vapor. Now, why is this important? Atoms of each element emit radiation at certain characteristic wavelengths. This is hydrogen, this is helium, this is argon, nitrogen, neon, mercury, carbon monoxide, and so on. Certain emission lines dominate the spectrum of each element. One can identify the elements from, its, from the spectrum of its emission lines. The ultraviolet radiation from hot young stars ionizes the gas in the vicinity of the stars. When ions capture electrons that are passing by, the electrons will be captured in very high Rydberg levels and then they will come cascading down to lower and lower energy level. And as they do that, they will emit radiation at very distinct wavelengths. The wavelength of the radiation they emit during each of the jumps will be determined by the energy level difference between the initial state and the final state. And the formula was the one given to us by Bohr, is H nu is equal to E1 minus E2, or E initial minus E final. This is known as recombination radiation. Why? Because the gas has been ionized. You have a plasma consisting of ions and free electrons. The electrons as they go by an ion are captured by Coulomb capture, and they radiate as they come down the Rydberg levels, and that is why this is called recombination radiation. 
Maybe here are examples of recombination radiation or tube lights in your house. Lights in the shopping districts such as these. They emit different colors because these lamps are filled with different gases. And the characteristic emission lines of these atoms is what gives them the color they have. Now let us look at hydrogen atom. And let us in particular look at some of the most famous series of lines that we get as the electron comes cascading down. You have the Lyman series, the Balmer series, the Parshan series, the Brackett series, and so on. I'm sure you have studied these in your pre-university college. The Lyman series are the lines that are emitted by electrons when they jump to the innermost level, which is n equal to 1 level. The Balmer series are the lines that, they emit, that are emitted when electron jumps to n equal to 2 level. In other words, the final level is n equal to 2. It could jump from n equal to 3 to 2, 4 to 2, 5 to 2, and so on, and then you get the various lines of the Balmer series. So the Lyman series is in the ultraviolet region of the electromagnetic spectrum, the Balmer series in the visible region, and so on. What about electrons when they jump from very high Rydberg level to the next level? For example, when an electron in a hydrogen atom jumps from n equal to 138 to n equal to 137, it emits radiation in the radio wavelength, which is what you see here. Here, for example, is radiation at a higher energy when the electron jumps from n equal to 110 to n equal to 109. This is known as H109 alpha. So these two big bumps are recombination radiation from the hydrogen atom. You can also have recombination radiation from helium atom, and that is shown over there. So the point I want to make is that this recombination radiation is not restricted to the ultraviolet or visible region. It comes even in the radio wavelength when the transition occurs in the very high Rydberg levels. How are gaseous nebula excited in the first place? As I said, a while ago, the gaseous nebula are excited by the ultraviolet radiation from young hot stars. The temperature, surface temperature of the sun is 6,000 Kelvin, and the peak of the black body spectrum peaks in the visible region. But if the temperature of the star is 20,000 degrees, then the peak of the black body spectrum will peak in the ultraviolet. Massive young blue stars are very hot. Therefore, their radiation will be predominantly in the ultraviolet region, and it is that radiation that ionizes the gas. Now, so these are the, these are the gaseous nebulae, and this is the reason why they shine, and we can infer the elements they are composed of by studying the spectrum of the radiation they emit. Now, besides Clouds of gas associated with individual stars or clusters of stars, one can ask the following question. Is there diffuse gas spread all over the region between the stars? In other words, is there a widespread interstellar medium? As early as 1785, Sir William Herschel noticed that the sky looks patchy with stars unevenly distributed, as you see in the slide here. And in some regions are particularly devoid of stars. He described, Sir William Herschel described these dark regions as holes in the heaven. There are no stars there, you can see through them in the heaven. In 1904, the Argentinian astronomer Hartmann was studying the spectra from stars in a binary system, two stars going around a common center of mass. Now, the wavelength of the stellar absorption lines 
showed as expected periodic modulation in the wavelength due to Doppler shift. Why is that? As the two stars are going around a common center of mass, as the star is approaching us, the wavelength emitted will be blue shifted, and as they are going away from us, it will be red shifted. Therefore, the wavelength of the radiation will be modulated as a sine or a cosine wave, depending on whether the star is approaching you or the star is receding from you. Now, what Hartman noticed was whereas most of the absorption lines, the two stars that he was studying, showed this characteristic dance of wavelength characteristic of Doppler shift, he found surprisingly lines of neutral sodium and singly ionized calcium. And what attracted his attention was that the wavelength of these lines due to sodium atom and calcium atom were stationary in wavelength. In other words, they did not participate in this Doppler modulation. From this, Hartman deduced brilliantly that the sodium atoms and the calcium atoms were not associated with the two stars that he was studying, Rather, they were present in the interstellar space. So this was the discovery of interstellar medium. Unfortunately, this brilliant discovery was not pursued by astronomers. Now we we'll move on to the year 1930. The astronomer Trumpler was measuring, was studying young star clusters such as shown in the figure over there. Trumpler was measuring the apparent brightness, the brightness that we measure, of a sample of star clusters. Some star clusters were near to us. Some star clusters were very far away from us. Therefore, you would not expect them to have the same apparent intensity. Now, let us assume that the sizes and the intrinsic brightness or the luminosities of the star clusters are the same. In other words, assume that they are standard candles of standard sizes. Then you would expect that the apparent brightness of the very distant clusters would be much lower and the apparent brightness of the nearby clusters will be much higher due to Newton's inverse square law. What is shown in this diagram on the y-axis is the apparent brightness or the intensity we measure as a function of the square of the angular diameter, the angular size solid angle they subtend. And what you would expect is what is shown in the line over there, a sloping line. Why will the line be sloping? Let us consider nearby clusters. Then the nearby clusters will have large angular diameter and they will have large apparent brightnesses because they are nearby. Whereas the far away clusters will have small angular diameters and small apparent measured brightness. Now what I'm going to show you is what Trimpler actually observed. He found that nearby clusters followed the expected behavior. Then, as you go and look at farther and farther clusters, the apparent brightness deviated what, from what you would expect from simple inverse square law, and the very far away clusters were in fact slightly reddened. This is what observations showed. This, the apparent brightness of far away clusters, was significantly less than expected from straightforward inverse square law. From this, Trumpler concluded that there is extinction of visible light from the star clusters and that the extinction must be caused by objects which are, whose sizes are comparable to the wavelength of radiation and therefore there must be dust particles. So Trumpler brilliantly concluded that there must be a lot of dust clouds in the interstellar space. And of course, where there is dust, there must also be gas, because it is out of gas, atomic gas, molecular gas forms, and larger and larger grains form, and finally dust grains form. Today we know that these holes in the heaven of Sir William Herschel 
or opaque clouds consisting of dust grains and molecules. These are known as giant molecular clouds. And the interstellar dust in these clouds causes the extinction of visible light. Here are some examples of molecule dark clouds. And I, I've highlighted two stars here with circles. And you notice that these stars are reddish. They are reddish because they are um, not too far into these clouds, so the light is able to escape from them. But on the other hand, the light is reddened for the same reason that the light from the setting sun or the rising sun is reddened compared to the sun overhead. Now, is there widespread atomic gas? If there is a diffuse interstellar medium, then it must be mostly hydrogen, the most uh, prevalent element in the universe. Now, this hydrogen gas may be atomic gas or it may be molecular gas. Now, how do we detect this gas? Well, let's consider it is neutral hydrogen in atomic form. Neutral hydrogen gas in the ground state does not emit any radiation, certainly does not emit any visible radiation, but it does emit radio radiation. Let's try to understand why a hydrogen atom in the ground state emits radiation. It has no business to emit radiation when it's in the ground state according to the Bohr model of the atom. Now, to understand that, let us digress for a few moments and discuss the Zeeman splitting of energy levels. What is it that we consider in Zeeman splitting? Let us consider a magnetic moment, a small ball magnet mu, in the vicinity of an external magnetic field H. And let us ask, what is the energy of interaction of the two magnetic moments? You agree that if there are two bar magnets, the energy, if they are north pole, north pole aligned, the energy will be different, and if the north pole, south pole aligned, the energy will be different. And the formula for the energy is the energy of interaction between these two bar magnets is given by minus mu dot h, where mu is the magnetic moment and h is the magnetic field. Now, let us, the little bar magnets that we are going to consider are electrons or protons. Therefore, mu is the magnetic moment of the electron or proton. What does quantum mechanics say about the magnetic moment of the uh, elementary particles? The magnetic moment is given by a formula minus C mu b times j, where j is the angular momentum. So let me say this once again. The magnetic moment of a particle is proportional to its angular momentum. And the proportionality constant is given by mu b, where mu b is known as the Bohr magneton. Then there is this little factor g here, which is usually 2 for an electron or a proton. Now, if you are considering a single spin, a single electron or a single proton, then its angular momentum is just the intrinsic angular momentum or the spin angular momentum. Therefore, the spin angular momentum, we will adopt the usual uh, notation of S instead of J. And for electron or proton, this factor J is 2. So you please, if you have studied quantum mechanics, you will know why G is 2. If not, you simply accept my statement that G is 2 for an electron. Therefore, the magnetic moment of, of an electron is given by minus 2 Bohr magneton into the spin quantum number S. Therefore, the energy of interaction is minus mu dot h, which is equal to the, since there are two minus signs, they cancel out, it's equal to g, Bohr magneton, into s dot h, where s is the spin angular momentum vector, and h is the magnetic field vector. Now, h, h dot, s dot h is the projection of the spin angular momentum 
parallel to the magnetic field, and that is usually denoted by letter ms, the projection of the spin angular momentum in the direction of the magnetic field. Now, quantum mechanics tells you that the projection of the spin angular momentum of the electron parallel to the magnetic field or perpendicular, I mean, uh, anti-parallel to the magnetic field is either plus half or minus half. It's only allowed to have two values, plus half or a minus half. And therefore, the energy of interaction of an electron or a proton with a magnetic field is if the two magnetic moments are parallel, then the energy is plus mu b times the strength of the magnetic field. If they are anti-parallel, it is minus mu b times the magnetic field. So pictorially, this is what it is. The energy of an electron in a magnetic field is plus or minus more magneton into the magnetic field. In other words, the energy level of the electron, which was previously E, is split into two levels. One is higher than the initial level, one is lower than the initial level, and the energy level difference, which is the energy level difference between that configuration and that configuration is 2 UB times the strength of the magnetic field. If the strength of the magnetic field is more, the splitting of the two energy levels is more. So that is a picture which is redrawn for your ready reference. Now let us consider a hydrogen atom in the ground state. You have the proton in the nucleus, it has a spin angular momentum. You have an electron in the n equal to 1 level of the atom, the lowest quantum number, and the electron also has a spin. Now the question is the following. Is the spin of the proton and the spin of the electron parallel to one another or anti-parallel to one another? Because depending on whether they are parallel or anti-parallel, the energies will be different. In other words, the ground state of the hydrogen atom, so, so the electron has a spin, proton has a spin one half h bar, the electron has a spin one half h bar, h bar is h divided by two pi, uh, two pi, and therefore the magnetic interaction between the proton and the electron will split the ground state of the hydrogen atom whose energy is minus 13.6 electron volt, as you know, it will split it into two levels. And the two levels correspond to the electron and proton spin being parallel, this is the upper level, and the electron and proton spin anti-parallel, which is the lower level. Now the question is, what is the energy level separation between these two? I told you the energy level separation will be Bohr magneton times the magnetic field. This time we don't have an external magnetic field. We have the magnetic moment of the electron interacting with the magnetic moment of the proton. So you have to do this calculation using quantum mechanics and what you find is this. If you were to express this in terms of frequency, the frequency of this radiation when the hydrogen atom in the ground state jumps from this upper hyperfine state, as it is called, to the lower hyperfine state, the frequency is 1420.406 megahertz. Of course, this is known to enormous number of decimal places. So it is 1400 megahertz. And its wavelength is 21.11 centimeter, or let's call it 21 centimeter. The energy of this radiation is obviously incredibly small. It is just 6 micro electron volt, 6 into 10 to the power minus 6 electron volt. Remember that when an electron jumps from n equal to 2 to n equal to 1 level of the hydrogen atom, it emits the H alpha line of the Balmer series that is in the visible and its energy is roughly 1 electron volt. Here we are talking about the energy being 6 micro electron volts. So this incredibly small amount of energy. And instead of visible wavelength, we have a wavelength of 21 centimeters. Now, 
Suppose I give you n hydrogen atoms in the ground state. I can now ask the question, how many of them will be in the upper state and how many of them will be in the lower state? If, we, if you have studied some um, uh, statistical physics, you will know that the ratio of the number in the upper state to the number in the lower state is given by e to the power minus delta E over kT, where delta E is the energy level difference between the upper and the lower level. It is multiplied by what is known as the statistical weight. The statistical weight is, the, is G, G is 2s plus 1. So if s is equal, if, if there are two spins, one half and one half parallel to each other, then the total spin is 1. So 2s plus 1 is 3. So the statistical weight of the upper level is 3, and the statistical weight of the lower level is 1, because if the two spins are anti-parallel, the net spin is 0, s is 0, therefore g is equal to 1. It is the same 2s plus 1 that gave a g factor for the electron as 2 because the spin of the electron is half, so 2s plus 1 is 2. All right, now I want you to appreciate something very, very important. Now, normally, when you're considering an energy levels of an atom or a molecule, you're talking of energy level separation in electron volts, many electron volts. Therefore, the number in different energy levels will be decided by the temperature, e to the power minus e over kT. This is Boltzmann distribution. Now, here, delta E is 10 to the power minus 6 over kT. kT, room temperature, 300 electron volts. Uh, sorry, 300 Kelvin. Uh, one electron volt is 10,000 degrees, a rough conversion. Therefore, this factor delta E over kT is incredibly small and it comes with a minus sign. Therefore, e to the power zero is just one. Therefore, the ratio of the number of hydrogen atoms in the upper level to the lower level will simply be the ratio of the statistical weight 3 is to 1. In other words, if I give you four hydrogen atoms, you will put three of them in the upper level and one in the lower level. If I give you six, you will put, sorry, if I give you eight, you will put six in the upper level, two in the lower level, and so on. So, I want you to appreciate that in the interstellar space, there are lots of hydrogen atoms. Three-fourths of them will be in the upper level, and one quarter of them will be in the lower level. What upper and lower level? These are the hyperfine split levels of the ground state of the hydrogen atom. The ground state, n equal to one state, which in Bohr's theory has a unique energy of minus 13.6 electron volts, has been split into two levels because the electron and proton spin can be either parallel or anti-parallel. Now, we will discuss this in detail later on, but you know that an atom in the ground state can absorb a photon and jump from a lower level to an upper level. This is known as stimulated absorption. Similarly, an electron in an upper level tickled by an incident photon can jump to a lower level emitting a photon. This is known as stimulated emission. But an electron on an upper level can also spontaneously jump to a lower level. Why will it spontaneously, spontaneously jump? Because it has been tickled. Tickled by what? There is no incident radiation. Well, it has been tickled by fluctuations in the vacuum. If you have studied quantum mechanics, you will know what I'm talking about. Otherwise, please accept that every atom can be stimulated to absorb, stimulated to emit, but an atom will also spontaneously emit. In one of the greatest papers that Einstein wrote in 1917, he insisted that there must be all three mechanisms and there must be in thermal equilibrium, and he argued and demonstrated that this is what gives rise to Planck's distribution for the spectrum of black body radiation. Now, let us ask the question, what is the transition probability of an electron 
jumping from the higher hyperfine level to the lower hyperfine level. Now you have to use quantum mechanics to calculate this transition probability and this transition probability is awfully small. The transition probability for jumping from the upper level to the lower level and emitting a 21 centimeter photon is incredibly small. It is 3 times 10 to the power minus 15 seconds or uh, stated the, the reciprocal of it is the lifetime of the upper level. In other words, if I prepare a hydrogen atom to be in the upper level, then the chances are it will stay in the upper level for a time which is the reciprocal of this transition probability. And the reciprocal of this transition probability is 1 over 3 into 10 to the power minus 15 seconds is roughly 10 to the power 7 years. Okay, 10 to the power 7 years. Please work it out, it's 10 to the 7 years. In other words, if I keep the hydrogen atom in the upper level of the hyperfine split level, then it will hang around there roughly for 10 to the 7 years before it jumps. Now, if I excite an electron in the hydrogen atom from n equal to 1 to n equal to 2, or n equal to 1 to n equal to 3, or n equal to 4, how long will it stay there before it jumps? It is a nanosecond. So the radiation will occur in a nanosecond. But here, for the radiation to spontaneously occur, you have to wait roughly 10 million years. Now, precisely because of this, this hyperfine radiation cannot be seen under terrestrial conditions. Why? Since the level, lifetime of the upper level is about 10 million years, long before there is a probability of a spontaneous jump to the lower level emitting a 21 centimeter photon, two hydrogen atoms can collide with each other in elastically exchange energy, and a hydrogen atom can come from an upper level to a lower level. Yes, it does lose energy, but that energy doesn't go into creating a photon. It can go into the kinetic energy of the other hydrogen atom, for example. There are many possibilities, and these possibilities are known as radiationless transition. Therefore, under terrestrial conditions, the 21 centimeter radiation cannot be observed because long before there is a chance for the electron to jump emitting a photon, it will be de-excited by some collision or other. In 1945, a young student by name Fandi Hulst, working with the great professor Jan Olt, about whom we shall discuss when we discuss galaxies, wrote a very famous paper in which he argued that this 21 centimeter radiation, while it cannot be easily observed on Earth, could be detected from interstellar space. Why? Because there are lots of hydrogen atoms in interstellar space. Even if the density is extremely low, this, the volume available is very large, and therefore there are a lot of hydrogen atoms. The second reason is, because the density is very really low, the mean collision time between hydrogen atom will be many millions of years. Therefore, a hydrogen atom which has been excited to the upper hyperfine level will have a chance to de-excite emitting a 21 centimeter photon. Now, why doesn't this happen for atoms uh, in the laboratory? Well, I'll give you a simple problem. Imagine the air in the room in which you are watching this video. Estimate roughly what is the mean time between collisions of two atoms. You know, you should know what is the mean velocity and you should know what is the mean distance. Then you can calculate the mean collision time. Do this calculation. And do the same calculation or hydrogen atom at a density of one atom per cubic centimeter and at a temperature of about 100 Kelvin. Convince yourself that in the latter case, the mean collision time is indeed very, very large. Therefore, there is a finite probability that the electron will be able to de-excite emitting a photon. 
Now, two, one physicist at Harvard, whose name was Edward Purcell, and Jan Oort, the astronomer in Leiden in Holland, said to graduate students to build equipment to discover this radiation. And this radiation was eventually discovered in 1951 independently by Ewan and Purcell in Harvard University in Boston and Mueller and Jan Oort in Leiden University in Holland. There's an interesting story about this discovery. I shall tell the story when we discuss Jan Oort and 21 centimeter once again when we discuss galaxies. But for now, it is uh, enough for you to know that Edward Purcell in Harvard and Jan Oort in Leiden and their students, Ewan and Muller, discovered the 21 centimeter radiation. There's an interesting thing here. In 1952, just one year after this, Edward Purcell was awarded the Nobel Prize along with Felix Bloch for their discovery of nuclear magnetic resonance, what MRI scans and so on, nuclear magnetic resonance. So within a span of two years, Edward Purcell and Harvard had made two monumental discoveries. One of them got the Nobel Prize, got him the Nobel Prize. Now, this discovery of 21 centimeter radiation truly revolutionized astronomy. I think it is fair to say this was one of the most momentous discoveries in the entire history of uh, astronomy, if you take into account the consequences of this discovery, the impact of this discovery, rather. Now, here I have tried to indicate what you expect to see with a radio telescope. What we have in interstellar space is a hydrogen cloud. It is spontaneously emitting radiation at 21 centimeter, which we can detect if we have a radio telescope that operates at 21 centimeter. Now, the important thing to appreciate is that the intensity of radiation as a function of frequency will not peak necessarily at a wavelength of 21 centimeters or a frequency of 1402 megahertz. Why is that? Because the hydrogen atoms in the cloud are not stationary. They are moving around. So if the hydrogen atom is moving towards you, that radiation will be blue shifted. Wavelength will be shorter. If the hydrogen atom is moving away from you, that wavelength will be red shifted according to Doppler's formula. Therefore, the frequency of the 21 centimeter radiation that you receive will not be the rest frequency of 1420 megahertz or the rest wavelength of 21.11 centimeter, but it will be Doppler shifted. It will be either blue shifted or it will be red shifted. So what astronomers usually do is to plot the intensity as a function of velocity because remember Doppler shift is delta nu by nu is equal to delta lambda by lambda is equal to v over c where velocity of the source in the direction of the observer and c is of course the speed of light. Therefore this is the sort of profile that you expect to see when you use a radio telescope to, to detect 21 centimeter radiation from neutral hydrogen atoms in interstellar space. Now, here I've indicated Doppler shift. So here is the uh, uh, hydrogen atom. It is moving in the direction of the velocity v. Therefore, the here we are observing from this direction. Therefore, for Doppler shift, what matters is v cos theta, or the radial velocity in the direction. Now, remember that radial velocity could be either pointing towards you or pointing away from you. That will give either blue shift or red shift, depending on the direction of so delta nu by nu, according to Doppler's formula, is the radial velocity divided by the speed of light. And the radial velocity is the vector velocity v into cosine theta, where theta is this angle. So that is Doppler shift explained through this simple diagram. Now, 
if the hydrogen cloud in interstellar space is diffuse, transparent, or in the language of our second lecture, its optical depth is small compared to unity, then the intensity of radiation that you will detect will be proportional to the column density of hydrogen. In other words, it will be proportional to the number of hydrogen atoms in a cylinder of unit cross-sectional area and whose length is the length of the hydrogen cloud. So the total number of hydrogen atoms in this cloud is N, subscript H for hydrogen. Therefore, the intensity of radiation that you measure with your radio telescope and electronics will be proportional to the total number of hydrogen atoms in the line of sight in a cylinder whose cross-sectional area is unity. Normally, we talk of number density small m, which is the number of hydrogen atoms or electrons or what have you per unit volume. Here, we are not talking of small n, we are talking about col uh, capital N, which is the column density, which is the total number of hydrogen atoms which are emitting, which are in the line of sight. So I will want you to notice that this intensity is proportional to the column density of electrons. Now, what is shown here in these four diagrams are the emission due to hydrogen in the interstellar space in some four arbitrary directions in the galaxy. Once again, this radiation is plotted, intensity is plotted as a function of velocity because you expect the radiation to be Doppler shifted and the velocity will tell you whether the cloud is moving towards you or moving away from you. It, is, it could be moving in arbitrary direction, but what you actually measure is the component of the velocity in the radial direction. And that component could be either coming towards you or moving away from you. Now, let us look at this interesting picture here. This is the galaxy. This is the center of our galaxy. And this is the sun at a distance of about 30,000 light years from the center of the sun. Imagine that there are three hydrogen clouds along this direction that I happen to be looking. What are these hydrogen clouds expected to be doing? Well, everything in the galaxies should go around the center of the galaxy, just as the planets in the solar system have to go around the sun, otherwise they will fall into the sun. Their circular velocities or tangential velocities will be tangent to this circle. I'm having problems with the cursor, as you can see. Uh, so depending on whether... Um, uh, let's look at this cloud. Its velocity is tangent to the circle on which it's moving. The velocity of this cloud is tangent to the circle in which it is moving, and so on. So what we'll be measuring is the projection of this blue arrow along the line of sight, V cosine theta. And the Doppler shift of, will be different for these three clouds. And that's what I meant in the previous slide by saying that what you expect to find in different directions are uh, uh, hydrogen emission intensity peaking at different radial velocities. So I hope this picture makes it clear that you do expect different radial velocities at different distances because everything is going around the center of the galaxy. Now, okay, that's a repetition, so let us skip that. Let's try to understand that was the emission so far. So far we were discussing emission, spontaneous emission of 21 centimeter radiation from hydrogen atoms in interstellar space. These hydrogen atoms can also be seen in absorption. Remember, anything that emits also will absorb. Now let us consider uh, a, a distant quasar, which is billions of light years away, and in our galaxy, in the interstellar medium, there is a hydrogen cloud. 
the quasar emits radiation at all wavelengths, including visible X-rays and so on. It also emits radio radiation. And let us say that this radio radiation passes through this hydrogen cloud. The radio radiation at the wavelength of 21 centimeter will be absorbed by the hydrogen atoms and it will jump from the lower hyperfine level to the upper hyperfine level. Therefore, the radiation at that frequency, radiation from the quasar at that frequency that is received by our radio telescope will be slightly less. It will be slightly less at what frequency? Well, there is no guarantee that the hydrogen atom which absorbs the radiation is stationary. So the absorption will occur at the Doppler shifted frequency just as the emission occurs at the Doppler shifted frequency. So what you see here in this beautiful uh, data that I have shown is the absorption of the 21 centimeter radiation by the hyperfine level of the hydrogen uh, atom in the interstellar space. Let me repeat once again, the radiation that is being absorbed is the radiation coming from a distant quasar. Quasar emits at all sorts of wavelength, but the optical depth of the hydrogen cloud is a function of frequency which will peak only near the 21 centimeter frequency of 14, 20 megahertz. If the hydrogen atom was stationary, if the hydrogen atom is moving, it will peak at the Doppler shifted frequency. So the important thing for you to appreciate is that the hydrogen atom in the interstellar space can be seen both in emission as well as in absorption depending on the geometry that we are talking about. When we are considering emission, we were not bothered with the background source. To have absorption, you must have a background source. Now in the case of absorption, remember, go back and revise the second lecture. The amount of radiation absorbed will depend upon the optical depth. The optical depth will depend upon the number of absorbers in the cylinder uh, units of unit cross-sectional area uh, whose length is the length of the hydrogen cloud. Therefore, the, the important formula is that the optical depth for absorption is proportional not only to the total number of hydrogen atoms in the unit cylinder, NH, just as emission is, but it is also proportion, inversely proportional to the temperature of the hydrogen cloud, which is Ts. Why it is called T subscript S is a different story, so we won't digress into that. So what I want you to appreciate is the following. For a gas hydrogen cloud to absorb radiation at 21 centimeter, two conditions must be satisfied. The column density must be very large. In other words, the number of absorbers must be very large and the temperature must be rather low. If the temperature is very high, the optical depth will be small and therefore the absorption feature will be very small. So I want you to know what I've written here, that for the optical depth to be large, the column density should be large, and or the temperature should be low. If both conditions are met, that's jolly good. You will get very good absorption. Therefore, I would like you to appreciate that whereas intensity of emission is proportional only to the column density NH, the absorption is proportional to both the column density and inversely proportional to the temperature of the gas. Therefore, if the gas is tenuous, if it is optically thin and warm, in other words, NH is small and T is large, then the optical depth will be small and therefore the absorption will be marginal or totally absent. On the other hand, if the gas is dense, in other words, if the, the number of hydrogen atoms is very large and it is cold, the temperature is very low, then the optical depth will be very large. Therefore, you will see the gas both in emission and in absorption. So let me repeat once again. If the gas is tenuous and warm, 
You will see it only in emission. Absorption is unimportant. If the gas is cold and dense, you will see the gas both in emission as well as in absorption. So let's look at some beautiful observations over there. What is shown in these six pictures there, my cursor cannot be seen by you, I apologize for it. I'll try to get it fixed by next lecture. What is shown above the horizontal axis in all these pictures is emission. Emission at various frequencies or various radial velocities. That is emission. And what is shown below the horizontal line is absorption. So that is absorption, that is absorption, that is absorption, absorption, and so on. So now I want you to observe very carefully the following thing that I'm going to say. Consider this direction, for example. What you do is you see both the gas in emission as well as in absorption. So clearly this gas is cold and dense because you're seeing it both in emission and also in absorption. Let us look at this direction. You see an emission feature here. You see an emission feature here also, but let us concentrate on the second emission feature which is inside this red oval. Or let us consider this emission feature which is under the red oval. You notice something very strange that is seen only in emission and you don't see any absorption. You notice that there is no absorption here. There is no absorption corresponding to that velocity. There is emission and absorption corresponding to this velocity. There is emission and absorption corresponding to this velocity. But there is no there is emission but no absorption at that velocity. There is emission and no absorption at that velocity. Therefore, from doing these observations in a very large number of galactic direction, it was deduced that there are actually two components to the hydrogen gas in the interstellar medium. We know that there is cold, dense gas because this gas is seen both in emission and in absorption. We also know that there is warm, tenuous gas, because you see gas only in emission, but you don't see it in absorption. So this led to the raisin pudding model of the interstellar medium. The raisin pudding model of the interstellar medium is just like the model of our atmosphere. If you look out of your window where you're watching this video, you will see clouds in our atmosphere. So what is it that you see? You see a diffuse atmosphere and there are discrete clouds. So it is not as though there is vacuum and there are these clouds. So there is diffuse atmosphere, there is cloud. The same thing obtains in the interstellar medium. So it's like a large pudding with raisins embedded in them or cashew nuts in your halwa, okay? So, there is an intercloud medium. From observations, astronomers have deduced that its temperature is about 10,000 Kelvin and its density is 0 0.1 hydrogen atoms per cubic centimeter. Remember, the number of molecules per cubic centimeter in your room is about 10 to the power 20 or 10 to the power 21 molecules per cubic centimeter. Here we are talking about 0 0.1 atom per cubic centimeter. So the number density is down by a factor of 10 to the power 23 or 10 to the power 22. Therefore, this gas, which is hot and very low density, is seen only in emission. So this is the gas that was seen only in weak emission, but no absorption. And then there were regions which were denser and colder, whose temperature is 100 Kelvin and whose density is 100 times larger, is 10 hydrogen atoms per cubic centimeter. I know that you are not impressed because we live in a world where the number of atoms, number of molecules per cubic centimeter is 10 to the power 20, 21, 22, 
whereas this is only 10, but that's a large number in interstellar space. And the mass of this typical mass of these hydrogen clouds is about a million solar mass. So they are enormous, their sizes are light years across. And these are the atomic hydrogen clouds. So just as in our atmosphere, there are clouds, and between the clouds there is diffuse gas. And these clouds are seen because they are dense and cold in both absorption and emission. So the raisins are seen both in emission and in absorption. The pudding is seen only in weak emission, but no absorption. But why are these clouds stable? Well, there has to be something preventing the clouds from diffusing and becoming at the same density as um, the rest of the atmosphere. Now in the case of a balloon, there is a rubber membrane. So why are these clouds um, uh, stable? Well, they are stable because there is pressure equilibrium. What do I mean by pressure equilibrium? There is a pressure of the gas inside the cloud. There's a number density N, temperature T. According to Boyle's law, the pressure will be NKT. That is Boyle's law of pressure, if you remember from my earlier lectures. And the intercloud medium has a density N intercloud, T intercloud, the Boltzmann constant cancels out. So the idea is that the pressure inside the cloud, which is trying to disperse the cloud, is the same as the pressure outside, and therefore the cloud is kept intact due to pressure equilibrium. Now, one of the interesting things is that if you take these numbers that are deduced from observations, you will in fact see that 100 into 10 is same as 10,000 into 0 0.1. Therefore, this principle of pressure equilibrium between the intercloud medium and the cloud is in fact uh, uh, obtained in the interstellar medium. And so, to not to go back to the slide, just to flash it here. It is from the fact that you see in some directions both emission and absorption. In some directions you see only emission but not in absorption. One was able to deduce this two component model of the interstellar medium. Now the motion of the interstellar clouds, first of all, because the cloud is at a finite temperature, the atoms are moving just like the, like the molecules in the air in your room are moving. But what we're saying is that the clouds themselves are in motion. Why? One is they participate in the galactic rotation. There is systematic motion due to the revolution around the center of our galaxy. And there are also random motions. Why are there random motions? There are random motion because there are shock waves from supernova explosions, which accelerate the clouds in this direction or that direction or that direction. A cloud is moving along merrily around the center of the galaxy, and suddenly from some direction a star explodes and the shock wave means it moves, and that's what I've tried to indicate in this diagram over there. So systematic motion, and there is superimposed on systematic motion, some random motion due to galactic collisions, if you like. Now, the 21 centimeter radiation was very quickly used to derive the large scale distribution of hydrogen in our galaxy. And what you see is the hydrogen gas in our galaxy, there at the center of our galaxy, the sun is over there, that, uh, where my cursor is, and what you see is that the hydrogen gas is not uniformly distributed, but it is distributed along some spiral arms. We shall discuss this in great detail in one of the coming lectures. Now, if you look straight towards the center of our galaxy with a radio telescope operating at 21 centimeter frequency and thereabouts to allow for Doppler shift, this is what you will see. You will see that the hydrogen gas is confined essentially to a thin plane, and there is some diffuse hydrogen gas above and below. So what has been deduced from observation is that the layer of hydrogen gas 
is about 700 light years thick, 350 light years on either side of the plane of the galaxy. So in other words, that green patch that you see in the bottom is about 700 light years, 350 light years on either side. It doesn't end there. What we mean is that the the, exp it's the density is decreasing exponentially, and the scale height of that exponential is about 350 uh, light years. In other words, at 350 light years, the density will become 1 over e. Now here we are looking at some external galaxies. Now, if you can, if I can get the cursor here, oh, there it is. Look at the blue radiation. Blue. These are all false colors done in computer. And the red and green are um, infrared radiation. So what you see is that the uh, blue is the atomic radiation, 21 centimeter radiation from the hyperfine levels of the hydrogen atom. So you see indeed that, uh, and, and, and as we will discuss in tomorrow's lecture, uh, next lecture rather, the dust clouds, which are made up of molecules, they are also confined to spiral arms. So what you see in this external galaxy is both the neutral atomic hydrogen gas as well as the molecular gas which is seen in the infrared radiation, not at radio wavelength. They are both confined to tightly wound spiral arms. Now, as I said earlier, the discovery of 21 centimeter radiation revolutionized astronomy. Suddenly, you could see through the entire galaxy, indeed, the entire universe. In visible light, if you look in the plane of a galaxy, you can only see the stars in our backyard, just a few hundred light years. Using 21 centimeter radiation, one has been able to model the rotation of our galaxy, as we will discuss in a subsequent lecture, as well as in hundreds of other galaxies, how the law of rotation of the galaxy. Now, this, these observations have also led to a startling conclusion that there is 90% of the mass of the galaxy, every galaxy, is non-luminous dark matter, whose nature we have absolutely no idea. And the 21 centimeter radiation has also had profound impact on cosmology. So with that, we end our brief discussion of the distribution of atomic gas in the vast space between the stars. In the next lecture, we shall discuss the molecular gas in the interstellar medium and how that is distributed. Thank you very much.